Welcome to today's discussion. I am very eager and very excited about introducing our guest. Please continue to, to subscribe, to like, to share. It's growing. Uh, I have been amazed at how you all have consumed the content. And it is a privilege. It really is a privilege to be able to put out content out there that's helpful and useful for people. Uh, this last week, I had an opportunity to speak at the Minister's Health webinar that was a webinar that went out to different ministers across the world, across our fellowship of churches, and it was an incredible time. And there were so many people that showed up, and I was I was surprised actually at how many folks were there, but we had a, an incredible conversation, and then the follow-up afterwards was something that I think was also very beneficial. I just want people to know who are listening. You know, you might be wondering what's going on for our ministers and so forth. They are trying to figure out what's going on for them, and they are putting the work in just like members are. And so I just want to put that out there because I feel like there's a lot of tension and a lot of, a lot of different things going on. And it was a great opportunity to be able to present as well. But for our speaker today, um, Dr. Roland Monhe, uh, he is someone who's very well educated. He has a master's in ministry. He has a doctorate in ministry. He serves as an evangelist and teacher. He is professor of Hebrew and Old Testament at Rocky Mountain School of Ministry and Theology in Colorado and director of Asia Pacific Leadership Academy in Manila. And I just want to say I had him for my first two semesters of Hebrew. Very challenging, but he was incredibly gracious and he is a very, very skillful teacher. Just need to put that in there. Um, Roland heads an international teaching ministry that he is uh, that has taken him to some 40 countries across the continents. He has also written five books. His research interests converge on Old Testament theology and languages. He and his wife, Wang, make their home in Manila. They have two, daughter, two daughters. And specifically, uh, a couple of the books that we're gonna draw from today uh, is the Psalms, Verses for the Heart and Music for the Soul, and After the Storm, Hope and Healing from Ezra Nehemiah. Roland, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, wh why I brought you on today, and, and I'm really excited for our audience to really sort of just be able to sink their teeth in, is that trauma is one of those things that's very dysregulating, very disorienting. And there are certain texts in scripture, certain genres that are very effective in helping to counteract and also heal trauma. And so that is what we're gonna be focused on today is using the Psalms, using lament literature to heal, specifically from trauma. So I just wanna make sure everyone knows that and I'm really excited to get into this. First of all, let, tell us a little bit about your conversion and why you went into the ministry. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I just want to say first that I'm honored to be invited to this channel. And I, I just want to appreciate you, man, for all that you're doing and the impact that this channel has been making. And uh, I'm excited for a topic today. But uh, about my conversion, uh, I came to know Christ as a freshman, freshman in college. I grew up um, in a fairly religious family with Christian values. And I'm really thankful for that. But, you know, I was, I was seeking, I was looking for something deeper. I was seeking for more um, authenticity. I felt I wasn't genuine in my walk with God. And so I would read my Bible often. I went to chapel. I sang in choir. But in my heart, I was longing for inner truth, you know, because um, I had hidden sins and there were issues I had to work on. And so there was a disconnect. And that was really the impetus for my big search. And then a classmate of mine invited me to study the Bible. Uh, well, he invited me to a Bible study group. And at first I was thinking, okay, I, I know some Bible. Maybe I can share what I've learned uh, and maybe impress them with what I know already because my grandmother is a pastora. <laughs> okay, so, um, and so I went there not realizing that that would be the thing that would change my life. And God really uh, opened my eyes. I saw true discipleship right before me. And um, I was intrigued by the, the way they studied the Bible with people and the things where they were emphasizing from scripture. 
and the scales fell and I saw what, what I was missing. And uh, oh yeah, and w- at one point I stopped studying the Bible uh, mm. var- for various reasons, but I also appreciate that they didn't give up on me. Uh, and so I continued my Bible studies and I got baptized 1990. Oh so, man, that was a while ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't look it. I'm serious, bro. You, you <laughs> aged un, unbelievably gracefully. Oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> why did well, you? I appreciate into, why, all the people who uh, help take care of me. So <laughs> helps, I guess. Why did you go into the ministry? Oh well, uh, I wasn't planning to be a minister. I wasn't aspiring to be a minister. I just love studying the Bible with people. I felt that I really wanted to embrace discipleship. I, I love studying the Bible with people, learning about God, telling people about God. And also, I think there is something about seeing people change and seeing how the scriptures transform people. That was thrilling for me. And so it was the fellowship, the work of uh, the ministry, and, and of course, great examples that inspired me to uh, be in the ministry. Of course, everybody's in the ministry, all, all, all saints and all our priests and New Testament, but, but I wanted to do this full time. So fast forward, I've uh, been in the ministry since 1994. Um, so part time first and then full time in 1995. So, so yeah, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve in this capacity. And I'm thankful for all the heroes that I have uh, in my faith. Start with what is a psalm? This is actually very hard to answer. It's funny, you would think that answering the question of what is a psalm would just be easy. But the more I've done my research on a psalm, it's hard to just put a singular definition on it. So I'm really interested in what your definition is. Yeah, it is difficult. It is difficult to uh, define what a psalm is. Uh, First thing that comes to mind um, would be expression. It's an expression of faith. So the psalms are expressions of faith of uh, of the people of God. But it's also faith expressed in art, in this case, uh, music. So I think that's one way to start um, discussions on what a psalm is. Um, we could get technical, of course. There are many ways to define a psalm. Technically, they are lyric poetry, and um, most people know that the English term derives from the Greek. Psalmos is uh, an instrument, a stringed instrument, or a song sung to instrumentation. And back then, plucked into instrumentation was it was typical. It was a typical background for lyric poetry. So you'd have someone singing or chanting, and then you have maybe a lyre or a harp in the background uh, as instrumentation. So that's one way to describe the Psalms. Um, Another way is to ask the Psalms how they would describe themselves. So Mm. they describe themselves as songs, the Hebrew word is shir. They they consider themselves or they, they describe themselves as songs, there are also poems, Mizmor, from Zamar, uh, and that's another way they describe themselves. So I think that would be a main category. They're song, they're, they are songs, they're also poems, they're also prayers, uh, tefillah. Uh, and so these are uh, words vocalized to God, um, cried out to God. Collectively, also, they are tehila praises. And so the Jews call this book Tehillim, a book of praises. So again, there are many ways to describe the Psalms. Um, I would say that you have to personalize your definition. Because for me, when I started reading the book, I, I, I started off thinking about these technical terms. And I got into things like, what's a miktam and what's a shigayon. But when I looked at the Psalms and started applying them in my life, and by the way, when I was writing the book, I was struggling with a, a host of things. Um, and I can talk about that more later, but, um, but yeah, I was struggling with a lot of different things. And I feel that the, writing the book was uh, therapeutic for me, but it was also, a, the book was a result of my own struggles and working with 
the Psalms. So I'd say personalize your definition and uh, and see how the Psalms uh, would uh, would lend themselves to a personalized way of describing them. Beautiful, and it's interesting how the Psalms aren't just this linear um, list of 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 items. You know that there are. I mean, we're talking about years and years between when the Psalms are written by different people, different authors, which you might get into some of that here in just a moment, but there's mm -hmm. different types of Psalms. You know, I think of like a Royal Psalm, there's, there's different, they're used for different things and they're used not just individualistically, but they're also used collectively. So a group of sure. people, which is where I get excited because part of what I've been trying to do is help people and groups of people address trauma and mm. the psalms are great because it, it it does involve individual as well as collective as well anyway so i could go on about that but there's different and i want to get into this piece now there's different types of psalms and if we're going to properly use the psalms we need to know how they work you know sure. and, and i and i and i i'm someone who since i've been a baby christian i could you know psalm 62 and psalm 63 have been some of my favorite what i've realized is that as i grow as a christian my ability to understand what the Psalms are saying, as it has grown, it is it's it's helped me to face some really hard things. But I, I've realized I've had to deepen my understanding of what's going on and how they work. So can we start mm. with a little bit of uh, how to properly use a Psalm in terms of the structure, the different types of Psalms and so forth like that? Just kind of want to give you the floor. Okay. Uh yeah, uh, a lot of these things I talk about in detail in, in the book, in my book, Into the Psalms. But um, I think as, as it relates to helping ourselves and helping others in community, I would start by saying that the Psalms are meant to be read and heard, read and heard. So we want to be good readers of the Psalms and good hearers of the Psalms. And benefits come with good appropriation. When we pray the Psalms after we read them, uh, then, then the benefits come. And, and the more familiar you are with, with the Psalms, the whole Psalter, like you mentioned, collectively, how they, they come together and how they impact us, then that's when you see how they are transformative. I also like to begin with uh, the introduction to the Psalms. I, I, in my book, I describe how Psalms 1 and 2 go together, and these usher uh, the reader into the book. And that clues us in to what to expect. According to the Talmud, Psalm 1 and 2, they're together, and Psalm 2 is a continuation of Psalm 1. I look at them as pillars, like for like doorposts. So they usher the reader into the book. And they tell us about the themes that we are to expect in the book of Psalms. Uh, for instance, Psalm 1 starts with the word ashray, which means blessed. And Psalm 2 also closes with that word. So blessedness, blessedness is a theme in the Psalms. In order to use the Psalms, therefore, in a proper way, you have to look at it from that lens. This is about being blessed. And uh, some other themes come out. Um, God, the theme of how God is the one who blesses. The blessedness is part of your relationship with God. How the word blesses the reader. Talks about God's power, sovereignty, and, and right choices. All of these are in Psalms 1 and 2. And so knowing how these two Psalms usher us into the book, that's, uh, that's really helpful for understanding uh, the Psalms. Uh, I also tell my students about uh, features of Hebrew poetry. So it's not like narratives that uh, come early on in the Old Testament. So it's important for us to be aware of some of these features in order for us to draw principles from them and to really make the most of our uh, study of the Psalms. Things like uh, terseness, how if you compare Hebrew narrative with Hebrew poetry, they might be talking about the same thing, like uh, Genesis 1 and Psalm 104 or Exodus 14 and 15. The poetry in the Bible has that terseness to it uh, that we, we are familiar with when we listen to the radio, right? 
<laughs> this is music here. This is art. This is poetry. So it's saying the same things, but not in a way that prose would do. Um, and then imagery. You want to be sensitive to how the Psalms paint word pictures, and it does so brilliantly that the Psalms do. Um, some other things would be parallelism, how uh, the, the psalmists echo things, says one thing, and then, uh, and then follows up with something added, and, and that kind of build, builds up a thought, and so putting those things together uh, helps you understand what he's trying to, come, uh, to convey. Uh, so those are those are some of the things that uh, come to mind. So that uh, we prepare our 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 minds to uh, be able to read the Psalms. John Calvin wrote a lot about Psalms, and to some degree, he had it right. You look at the Psalms at, at face value first. You you see them as literature. These are um, uh, poems, lyric poetry, but they're also tools. And so you have to be ready to use those tools such that you uh, make the most of uh, your use of, of the Psalms. Uh, I, I hope that's making sense. That's perfect. I love that you talk about using the Psalms um, and they are meant to, so let me just recap something that really stuck out to me is they're meant to be read sure. and heard. Love mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Because a public reading of scripture is something that, at least in our Western context, we, we've kind of gotten away from. And as far as people standing, like it was a big deal in the Old Testament when God's word was read. It was an event. And sure. it was used to, to, to create community. It was used to create some cohesive, cohesion. And so that idea of being read and being heard, I also like kind of the implications of this when we're reading in our personal devotional times is we need to read it, read it aloud. There's something that activates mm -hmm. the text when we use our voice, when we use our, dare I say, our ruach to, you know, our, 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 our spirit, our wind, our breath to, breath. to, mm -hmm. to really activate it. Um, there's something powerful about that. I think sometimes when I read the Psalms, I can just read it to myself. But if I'm honest, I think there is a difference from when I read it to myself versus read it out loud. There, there's something in, I start mm. to resonate with it a bit more. So anyway, I, I love that piece. Mm. Um, and then I just, I really like the idea that the Psalms are meant to be used. And then mm. the, the next question is, is used for what? So this mm. gets into the different types of Psalms. Uh, what kinds of things are the Psalms used for? Okay, uh, well, you, you mentioned structure and then you mentioned use. Yes. Uh, those things go together, okay? okay. First, I wanna say a little bit something about the structure. There is, so there's structure in the book of Psalms. So I talk about that in my book. There are five books, of course, in the book of Psalms. And then there's uh, a way that the Psalms are arranged such that they um, evoke emotion and they tell a story. And we can talk about uh, that more later. But there's also structure within the individual psalms, just like songs today. Uh, different songs have different uh, styles. Yeah, some people prefer this genre over another. And so it's just like listening to different songs on the radio or Spotify. So the same thing with the, with the psalms. Now, structure relates to function. And the German scholar, Hermann Gunkel, was very good at this form criticism and all that. But he realized that the, the different parts of, of the Psalms come together for certain functions, for certain results. And so uh, in my book, I also uh, talk about that. Now, there are different types of Psalms, but we, we want to be careful about um, thinking about structure too much that we forget about the overall effect of the Psalms. You know what I'm saying? So uh, like, like Bruce Waltke, uh, one time he, he was talking about uh, uh, the structure of the Psalms, but it's, it, he said, I hesitate to do this, like pick a Psalm apart, you know, to the, the different uh, cola, the different strophes, because it would be like a botanist picking apart a flower in order to understand it. So yes, we have to discuss structure. We have to look at how the different parts of the Psalm come together, but also we have to keep in mind that the, the Psalmist intended for the Psalm to be received as a whole. 
See, so I, I just want to put that in because uh, we don't want to be uh, engaged too much in the form that we for, forget about the overall impact. Uh, but anyway, we uh, talked about the different types, right? And we mentioned the different types. I, I've read how different scholars uh, classify the Psalms. There are many ways of classifying the Psalms. But again, form leads to function. And so I would say to start simple with um, understanding the different types of Psalms. I refer to 1 Chronicles 16 in my book, where the Levites use the Psalms for three different things. And that leads us to three basic types of Psalms. The first one would be a hymn or praise Psalm. And that's when we sing um to god and you know, we're enjoying life we're shooting the breeze it's all fine it's all good so life is untroubled so the praise psalms vocalize those times and then laments that's another type of psalm a major type when things uh, have gone bad and then thanksgiving psalms and these would be psalms that are sung when God has um, answered your prayers. So those would be three main types of psalms. I like uh, putting them in those basic categories first. And what I do in my book is I further break down those three categories into other types of psalms. Like, for example, a hymn psalm could be a creation hymn uh, or a personal uh, praise, uh, song of praise, etc. But I would start with those basic three. I love that. And and I I, I like the way you broke that down. I, I've not heard that before. Um, it's probably pretty standard. As I, as I continue to study Psalms, I'm sure uh, I'm going to run across a lot more. But that's why I'm having you on, because you've studied this out so deeply. Uh, I use R Walter Brueggemann's um, kind of three structure uh groupings of it you have psalms of orientation psalms of disorientation and then psalms of reorientation the reason mm -hmm. why i use that this actually goes into our next question is because when we go through traumatic experience it fractures our understanding of the event being over so in other words when we go through a traumatic situation that just kind of overwhelms our ability to time stamp a situation okay. that we've experienced that sense of it being over is lost. And so what happens is, is people have this sense of orientation about themselves and the world. And then there's an experience that happens that shatters that. And now they're thrown into disorientation, as Brueggemann puts it. And there's certain mm -hmm. Psalms that are really well, uh, really speak well to that experience of being disoriented. And then ultimately you have reorientation, which is you base your understanding about the nature of reality off of God's character. And that sort of gets you to the next point, which is true, true resilience. True resilience is based off of capacity to deal with life mm. on life's terms, that mm -hmm. things are gonna happen. It's, it's not just, I got through that, whoo, hopefully nothing ever happens again. That's not resilience, that's not true resilience. Ultimately, the Psalms of reorientation build a, resi a res resilience in a person that allow them the capacity to deal with future traumas. And that's kind of scary when you think about being a Christian is like, ah, wait, more stuff is going to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, sure, sure. But the, the, I like the way he sort of structures that. And I think that can work for some people, especially trauma researchers like myself, who, you know, I need something that sort of parallels to the experience of overwhelm. Um, anyway, but Brueggemann is someone who you've probably got 10 of his books or whatever. I mean, you're someone that you very much endorse, I'm assuming, right? He, he's got at least five books on Psalms, and I especially like his, his book, uh, The Spirituality of the Psalms. Mm. Um, he, he, he talks ab about how he's so drawn to uh, the Psalms that there's an, uh, he, he calls it an unresolved fascination. <laughs> <laughs> because you think you think the psalms uh you think you, you know the psalms already they're pretty straightforward they're so simple but then you uh you read them again and you realize okay this seems like i haven't read before and and, and that's that's not surprising because you have life changes yeah. you have life stages who you are this year is vastly different 
than who you are, were last year. You know, yeah. There are many aspects of our lives that change. And that's why the Psalms are just so brilliant in the way they engage us. You can never have enough. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's awesome. Well, let's transition into just, just that issue of, of how could someone use the Psalms when they, let's say they're working through a traumatic experience mm, okay. or they have anxiety or they have depression. I mean, this is real. Mental health is at this point undeniable. You know, in the last year, think about the pandemic. I, I have no doubt in my mind that there are people who went into to the pandemic that didn't have maybe the noticeable trauma or anxiety or depression. And after the pandemic, that's changed. Surely. Mm. And so I, I'm wondering how the Psalms can be useful for that. Mm. Yeah. Well, first, I, I want to say thanks to you and so many who are helping people um, these last two years. I, it's just horrendous what have, people have gone through. And I just want to hold you guys up in high regard because it's, it's just not easy. And uh, for us in the helping professions, um, I, I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing. Um, but yeah, with the Psalms, I would say the Psalms are all about healing because they, they assume that there's going to be trouble. They're all about <laughs> healing. So they cry out. They're saying, God, heal me, help me. That's what, that, that's what they're saying. Uh, and, and that's why they're so uh, relatable. You've got all the experiences in the Psalms, all the, the feelings, the whole gamut of, of human experience. And so they, they speak a, a lot about good times, but also speak a lot about pain. When I, when I talked about the three types of Psalms, the most common type is not the praise Psalm. It's not the Thanksgiving Psalm, it's the lament. You have so many laments. And among those five books that the, the book, the Psalter is divided into, you've got a, uh, the, the, the laments dominating uh, initially. It's only at the end when, when the praises dominate. Sure, there are praises everywhere, but there's lament all throughout. And I think about that, that speaks uh, volumes about the human experience. The Psalms speak about pain. The Psalms acknowledge that there will, there will be suffering. Mm -hmm. There will be suffering uh, in this world. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, I, I, I find the Psalms as great uh, tools for, for dealing uh, with pain. And I actually have a chapter on that. Um, since we're talking about tools, right? Everybody appreciates a good tool. Yep. So in my book, I devote a couple of chapters on uh, the Psalms uh, be, uh, being appropriated, being used in our lives. And one chapter, I entitled it, The Psalms as Life Tools. And I talk about a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, um, the first thing that I talk about is expression, expression. The Psalms provide us with a safe place to talk. I consider the Psalter as a as um, a place for rendezvous. It's like your favorite coffee shop. It's wow. like your favorite picnic uh, picnic uh, area. You know, so uh, you are allowed to speak. You know, in Asia. We have a tendency, and I, I don't want to uh, um, overstate myself, but we have a tendency to stifle our feelings, okay? Uh, avoid conflict. And so in the Philippines, we have this thing called hiya, which is shame, and the word jahe, which is something similar. And there are many equivalents in, in Asia. But anyway, it's, uh, it's keeping things to yourself because you don't want to... Uh, cause any harm you don't want to disturb uh, people you don't want to ruffle any feathers you don't want to dis disrupt the happiness of others at the expense of honesty at the expense of being real to yourself and you know what we do that to god sad to say wow so 
many elements of what I just talked about, right? The way we stifle our feelings, we stuff them in and we, uh, I know that has different par parallels in, in different cultures, right? And so we, we, we keep things in, we don't vent those feelings and we think everything's okay. But the relationship isn't what it's supposed to be if we don't say what we need to say. So I, I think we do that to God. We don't want to offend God. We're walking on eggshells with God. And so we distance ourselves emotionally. So the Psalms help us express. Uh, Eugene Peterson talks about in, in one of his books, he says, we've grown accustomed to talking about God rather than talking to God. Oof, oof. You see what I'm saying? Oof. Right? And so <laughs> that oof. results in repressed thoughts, repressed feelings, right? So the Psalms help us, they, they're good friends it help, that help us to express. And, and you see, God knows what's going on anyway, right? You can't actually, you can't hide from God what's happening to, to you. So might as well bring it up, might as well say it. And so for me, I had to learn this. I'm not good at this. And I realized uh, when I was studying at the Psalms, I go, wow, I've been dishonest in my prayers. I've been, I've been insecure in my prayers. I, I, I think too much. I overthink even in my prayers. But God is ready to listen to all those prayers. He's going to take it in and he can take it, right? So that was something that really healed me because uh, maybe there's a good time to share about what happened. I had a seizure. See, I had a seizure uh, first time uh, as an adult to have a, a seizure I, we were serving in one of the islands and um, I lost consciousness suddenly. Uh, um, well, I, I did have a fever the night before. I lost consciousness and then my eyes rolled back um, and I didn't remember anything. Um, so there are different tests. I stayed in the hospital uh, a week or so, I think. But, but anyway, it, the, the results came back and they said it's... Um, um idiopathic so um it, tests were inconclusive uh, i would joke around with my wife idiopathic so they're saying i'm an idiot and pathetic idiopathic oh. <laughs> wow. but anyway <laughs> what a sense of humor <laughs> but 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 anyway uh, a lot of tears there um and uh, and so i started writing the book before that happened and you can imagine I was struggling with all these different things, but I le really learned to, to pray the Psalms. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm still learning, but I, I really believe it, result, it results uh, in a lot of people, a wider emotional bandwidth to deal with the things that happen in our lives. So that's the first thing that I talk about in my book is expression. Um, and, and, and related to that is catharsis, okay? The, the Psalms give voice to the things that we can't say or these inner feelings, the, the latent feelings. And, and you know how, how uh, the Bible talks about people being or having layers to us, right? The things run deep. So catharsis is, is crucial for transformation. Catharsis paves the way for insight and then in, from insight comes transformation. And so again, this all goes back to how honest prayers can help. So eh, may, maybe we can talk about that for now. Yeah, I really appreciate what you just shared. I, I feel moved. I'm like, oh, that honesty, peace with God. And I was thinking about this the other day when I was, I've, I've been, my wife and I have really been searching out shame and grace. Like what, what, how are, what are we supposed to do with our shame? Like oftentimes mm. in Christianity, we have a place to put our sin, but we don't really have a place to put our shame. And, um, mm. and what is grace? Like really like, what, you know, and, and grace is actually kind of scary. Um, Cause there's this aspect of realizing how human you really are. 
And it's scary to be human because you realize you can get hurt and you can hurt others. And so this idea about shame and grace is all about the part of us that we're ashamed of our humanity in ways that God isn't. Like, especially when we look at the Old Testament, some people think the Old Testament is where you find grace. No, the Old Testament is where you find grace. And God is so patient. I agree. Totally. totally. He's so patient, but he and, and also realizes how human we are. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was not ashamed of his humanity. Mm -hmm. And this is part of my thesis work, which is biblical humanity. And it's a whole nother whatever. But that that the Psalms, to me, it's almost like what you're saying is that God expects us to be human. And he gives us this, this interface of the Psalms to bring our humanity to him. And he's not mm. ashamed of our humanity. He's the one who made us human. He's right, not, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and that's why yeah. I'm sorry. And that's why Calvin says the Psalms are an anatomy of all parts of the soul. Wow. I mean, talk about being human, man. Oh man. <laughs> Say that again, that the, the Psalms are an anatomy of all parts of the soul. Wow. I like that a lot. <laughs> I'm going to use that. It's the reason why I bring this up is because a lot of us, we don't have permission we don't, we don't have a mechanism that gives us permission to feel all the things. Mm. And, you know, when you think about where people get stuck in their trauma, typically it's nonverbal. Uh, this is why someone who's a trauma researcher like myself, the Psalms are of particular interest. Because when you're treating trauma, you have to find a mechanism that works with the image. When trauma comes along, it, it distorts, it really fractures a person's ability to do story. Mm. And so what they're left with are these little fractured half stories and half pieces that don't make sense. And so what they really need is they need a mechanism that allows them to work with that one piece, right? The one piece. And this is where I talk about making peace with the pieces. Right, right. Imagery is necessary for trauma healing. You have mm. to have a mechanism that works with the image and, and poetry um, does that probably better because there's this paradox of you can't name it because you don't have the words because the part of your brain that relives during trauma shuts down. Mm, and so we need mm -hmm. something that can help us with the, not just the image, but the hyper hyperbole. So one of the things mm. trauma does is it gets you to feel really big feelings and you don't have words for those feelings. Well, this is what's mm. so cool about God's word is that there are many parts of scripture that are based in hyperbole. They're based in extreme. And some of us who are right, literal right. are really going to struggle with that because we're like, well, technically my blood isn't boiling. Like we, we get to, I like what you said earlier about not being too analytical because there are parts of the Psalms that are just meant to be ingested. And in doing that, it helps us to work through things that we can't find words for anyway. So there, there's so much more going on and, and to some, some degree, something like the Psalms for some of us who've been through some really hard stuff is your best bet at getting healing. Mm. And so it's very important that we find the adequate mechanisms. Anyway, that I just wanted to throw right. that in there. Is it related to, to mental health and trauma and all that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I would say that, I need the Psalms because I think I share qualities with some people who are too left brain. I don't, maybe because of our culture, yeah. but poetry and music open doors, man. It's just amazing. The things that you do, the things that you feel uh, because of, uh, of Psalms as you work on these inner feelings. I remember teaching a, a, a class in Virginia for small group leaders. And what I did was I took them through Psalm 10. And Psalm 10 begins with questions. The Psalms ask questions brilliantly. Mm. And the way that they, they shoot them up to God almost uh, irreverently, <laughs> yeah. you know, questioning God. What, what's up with you? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? But, but those resonate with people in, in many profound ways. So I think I would have been stuck in my insecurity, I've been stuck in my doubts. Uh, if I didn't study the Psalms in earnest and, and discovered how the poetry really, um, really laid out the way forward for me. 
I, I appreciate that. And I, the thing that was really sticking out to me about what you're saying is the the level of censorship that we have is inappropriate. Like I was thinking about this the other day, the difference between real and raw real is when you've had an opportunity to, to work through your rawness and you're real, but it raw is where you haven't had a process of refinement. There, there's no, it hasn't gone through any filters. And I think as Christians, well, I'll just speak for myself. I was thinking about this the other day about like, I struggle to invite God into my mess. Like mm. if there's an area where I feel like, you know, either I'm angry or whatever it is, like I'm struggling with, I feel like I need to do some sort of sanitation before I invite God into it. Because there's part of me that feels like, well, God is so holy. He needs me to get myself together before he like, like I, I need to clean up the house before I, I invite God in over for coffee. And mm. the truth is, and I'm struggling with this still, I really am, bro, is that I could invite God into, if I, let's say I was having a lustful moment or I was having a moment of hatred, I could invite God into the epitome of that moment. That's what the cross is. The cross is literally mm. Mm. inviting God into the ultimate mess. I can invite God into a place where, and let's say my heart isn't even ready to change. Sometimes I'll like, if I keep God out of that area, cause I'm like, well, I need to get my heart right. And then I'll come to you. But I'm realizing he actually wants to get in on all of it. He wants in on all the action and he doesn't want us true, to censor true. it. And I'm like, true. I feel like I have to censor it. Cause this is a holy God who to your point knows your thoughts. Regardless, we can't keep anything from him. <laughs> That's true. He knows it all anyway. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's, I'm realizing the level of intimacy that he wants again is, is, is intimidating. So. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And, and you, you know what? Jesus exhibited that all the time. Yeah. He was so familiar with the Psalms and for him to quote Psalm 22 at the cross, that is just mind blowing. Huh. So he was familiar with the Psalms. He, he spoke about the Psalms. He frequently uh, referred to the Psalms in his ministry. And he knew he was the fulfillment of the Psalms. Uh, but yet there's, there's a, 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 a special connection he had with these songs that is just amazing. I wish I could learn that more. Yeah. There's a, a quick study I'm going to just share. This, this is for those who are interested in, in research, which... Uh, you know, Roland is someone who's a, an avid researcher as well. I shared this uh, just briefly at the Minister's Health webinar, this concept of psalmic disclosure. And there's an article I can make available as well. Um, but this idea of psalmic disco disclosure is this process wherein you take a psalm, you study it, and you, you have some bib biblical literacy, kind of like, you know, Roland's talking about here. And there's a couple of things that they found is they, they worked in this study where it was Zulu youth participants studying Psalm 3 and 13. So long story short, there were certain repetitions, metaphors, mood, rhetorical questions. You were just talking about that complaints, expressions mm -hmm. of trust, praise and hope. And they educated them a little bit, just a little bit on how the Psalms work. And then what they found was that there was a connection between when you when you teach somebody how a Psalm works, then how they when they, it's their turn to write their psalm, they will employ that same structure and it'll come over. And the reason why that's healthy is because we want to have some biblical literacy. In other words, when we apply sure. something now, we want to make sure that it was applied, that it matches how it was applied then. We can't do that exactly, but we can't make something mean now what it never meant then, right? Sure. You think about Gordon and Fee. True. Um, So there's that piece, but what they had them do is they had them write their own Psalms. And what they found is, is everything you're saying, literally everything you're saying, Roland, I think is, is kind of what they found is that the, the Psalms provided witnessing power for mm -hmm. people. Uh, trauma is a very lonely experience because it, it, sometimes when you experience like an attachment injury or a profound dehumanization moment, it strips you of like your humanity, but other your connection to other people's humanity, like there's like a loss of self and a loss of security and levels that people don't realize. But the texts allow for our experience to be witnessed to and then it also gives people the certainty of being heard. I think 
one of the hardest mm. things when we go through really hard things is that we don't know if we're, we just need to be heard. And, True. you know, I did an interview with Dr. Diane Langberg about this concept of voice. One of the things that's really needed when you go through a really hard time and, and you went through with the seizures and the health stuff is that we need a way to have voice. You know, trauma strips us, strips us of our voice. And mm -hmm. I think that safety, the permission, I think the key that you've mentioned today that I think this study really alludes to, alludes to as well is permission. It's just as a Christian, do we have permission to be that honest with God? And the answer mm. is yes. Mm. Can we be that honest? And what I'm hearing you say today, and this study is also saying, is that we have permission to be totally honest with our God. And, and right. that's, that feels risky, Roland. Like, I got to be honest. It feels like, what if I offend God or what, if, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I, I, I think we have a lot of um, countercultural discussions that have to be made in order to help us see that there is permission. There is permission to say these things that are raw or, 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 or crude. And I, I think about Psalm 88, which ends with darkness is my closest friend. <laughs> I mean, it literally is companion darkness, right? So there's nothing happy about this song it's all sadness uh, but but see god allowed that god allowed many laments a uh, majority of the psalms to be laments and so psalm 88 and maybe a close second uh, if psalm 88 is the saddest song close second would be psalm 39 but if there's anything that is positive in such sad poems it's the fact that it mentions god by saying you you which is a it could be a hebrew pronoun an independent pronoun or a connected pronoun but that's the only thing positive you allow me to verbalize this you allow me to tell you how i feel you allow me uh you accept me you're my god no matter what and while i'm here you're still my God. Uh, real quickly, what are some examples of uh, how we can use the Psalms to better understand the New Testament? You had mentioned Psalms 1 and 2. Uh, I think Psalms 10 is used in the New or No, Psalms 8, I think, is used in the New Testament. Anyway, you, you help me to understand. A lot of you Psalms. Help us to understand. A lot of Psalms. Yeah. <laughs> uh, share a little bit about how the Psalms can help us to understand the, the New Testament better. Yeah, well, we talked about story already. We have to see that the New Testament church is a continuation of the story. And so from Malachi to Matthew, we want, we want to be sensitive to the story that's going on and how Jesus is the fulfillment uh, uh, and the focus of, of that story. But, um, well, we can talk about this on many different levels. Uh, of course, the Psalms are part of Jewish literature. And Jesus used uh, the Psalms in, uh, in his ministry, and so does Paul and the other New Testament writers. So uh, one thing I like about the book of Psalms, it is very much quoted. quoted. It is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Now, there's a little debate on whether it's Isaiah or Psalms, uh, particularly with you know, if, is it a direct quote or an illusion? But you want to look at the use of Psalms in the Gospels, like how Jesus used uh, the Psalms. He talked about the kingdom using the Psalms. He talked about himself using the Psalms. And um, as a resurrection, he says that Psalms speak about me. Paul, same thing, right? He used the Psalms quite often to uh, make uh, different points. Uh, he used Psalms quite a bit in Romans. Um Hebrews. Hebrews is a running commentary on Old Testament passages, uh, including Psalms. So those are some things that you might want to study on your own. Uh, so, you, uh, so you can have a, a deeper understanding of how the, uh, the Psalms figure in New Testament theology. Personally, I really like looking at how the Psalms look forward to Jesus. They help us understand Jesus more because, um, well, they, they, they all prefigure uh, in many ways Jesus. And I have a whole chapter on that in my book, 
how the Psalms point us to Jesus, different aspects of his life, his person, uh, his ministry. You also want to look at uh, Jesus and uh, his, uh, his ministry, his role as a continuation of David. David is a type or prefigure of Jesus. And actually all the Psalms, I already mentioned this, point to Jesus because you see the, the, the Psalms yearn for something that they know is not there yet. Uh, I forget which author said that the Psalms have theological sighs. You know, they're like sighing. They're anticipating something that's not there yet. And that's Jesus, okay? So when you read the Psalms, you get a better understanding of Jesus and therefore also what we have in Jesus. You understand how uh, Jesus worked through uh, the different things in his life by studying out how Jesus used the Psalms, but also how all of the Psalms point to this person, the Messiah, who is the fulfillment of the Psalms. I appreciate you connecting those two because a lot of folks, you know, we really struggle with the the connection between the Testaments. You know, I think of like, if you were to take a, a year to read a Bible, uh, you wouldn't, so you started in January, you wouldn't get to the New Testament to October. <laughs> like, the, <laughs> and, it, and not only that, is it just voluminous, we struggle to make the connections between the covenants and between the Testaments. And so I love that you're you're speaking into that. I, I really would encourage people to make more of those connections because it, like it's integrated, right? Integration True. is the both and, and I think that's has some unlocking power. Um, real, I just, I want you to tell us a little bit about your two books that I, I'm really excited about reading. And I mm -hmm. also am excited about recommending. So I, I named two books that you, you had, if there's more you want to recommend as well, can you just tell us about your two books that you've been referencing through this, uh, this, this presentation today? Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, into the Psalms, I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, yep. yeah, there you go. Yeah, into the yeah. Psalms. So I begin with helping the readers understand their world. So the first part is into their world. And the second part is into their message. So you want to get into the historical background, uh, context of the Psalms, and then what, what, what did they say? So I talk about extensive themes in the Psalms, including how Jesus uh, figures in, in the Psalms, and then into our lives. That does, that's the third part. So into the, their world, into their message, into our lives. And that's when I talk about the Psalms as life tools. And uh, that's also uh, where I, uh, I talk about things like, like I mentioned, expression. I talk about meditation, how the Psalms are useful for for meditation, Psalm 70, 77 being a great example of that. Um, I think um, mindfulness is also related to meditation, becoming self-aware. Uh, I talk about forgiveness as well in that section, uh, how we can work through these painful ex experiences and how the Psalms provide a pathway for, for healing, allowing us to forgive. Uh, particularly because the Psalms tell us that uh, we don't sweep things under the rug. When something wrong was done to you, you've got to say it's wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wrong was done. Harm was done. And that uh, opens doors or prepares our hearts for forgiveness. I also talk about forgiveness as being something about more about our relationship with God. It, it, it's something spiritual, not just relational sometimes we think of forgiveness as only relational but it also uh, more importantly has to do with uh, our relationship with god um in that section i also talk about resilience and how uh we can uh come out of of suffering by making sense of these uh harmful untoward events and um uh, that was that was actually a chapter that I felt I very much needed because uh, you know how suffering comes. It, it, it you have the event of the the suffering, the untoward situation or or hap or event, and then how you treat yourself mm. also brings brings suffering. And my tendency is to 
uh, add harm, you know, uh, self-inflicted pain. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so those are the three parts of the book. And um, uh, I, I, I also use this as one of the textbooks in uh, my course on interpreting the Psalms at uh, uh, Rocky Mountain. So that's into the Psalms. The other one is After the Storm, um, Hope and Healing from Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm glad you talked about the, the exile yes. uh, because this talks about the, the continuing saga after the exile. And so what did they do? How did they feel? How did they uh, overcome uh, the, the, this unthinkable tragedy, which was uh, the exile? So I talk about context, I, I say a um, little bit about the, the history, and then I break down the books per chapter, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, and also, um, yeah, uh, try to make their message relevant by drawing principles, timeless principles, as what I do with um, other books. I, I'm really looking forward to those. In fact, I, both of what you've shared, it, it's going to fit really nicely for my audience, uh, the audience that I have of, of or folks who a wide range of awareness of understanding mm. how their trauma has mm. affected them. A lot of folks have wounds from their kidhood, others who have massive church hurts, both even, uh, you know, people mm. are just trying to get their head around what they've been through and how to like what their next steps are. And I feel like you've just given like you've already done the work. <laughs> <laughs> in many ways, well, I'm putting the thought into this. And so I'm excited. There's still so much to learn, man. Yeah. I, I don't consider myself an expert. I don't either. <laughs> Just so we're clear. <laughs> yeah. Are there are there any announcements you want to share with us before we bring it in for a landing? Oh, uh, well, uh, of course, the books are at ipibooks.com. Okay. And uh, also, After the Storm has been translated into Japanese and Korean. So you can send me an email if you're interested. Uh, prayerfully, there, there are already some sections, I believe, the, uh, with the uh, uh, Russian translation, but pre please pray about that. Um, and then um, uh, please pray for another book on Psalms. Hopefully it will come out um, first quarter, maybe next year. Ooh. Yeah, uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then, um, if you're interested, there there are po I have podcasts, ten podcasts on Psalms at douglasjacoby.com with our beloved colleague uh, Doug Jacoby. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure we get that on, in the description as well. What I want to share with you, what I share with all my guests, and and it, it's so true that we are with you. And God is for you, my brother. Thank you for today. Well, you're very welcome. It's an honor being here. And uh, thank you for all that you do, man. Appreciate all that you do. Absolutely. Well, if you've stayed with us the entire uh, discussion, which there are most of you, many of you who do, and then there are others of you who literally rewatch this over and over and over, and I feel super intimidated and convicted about that um thank you uh the channel is continuing to grow uh hoping it i don't know be it 2000 subscribers by the end of the year maybe more than that I don't, I don't know but i'm just grateful that the word's getting out uh please continue to like share and subscribe uh coming next year i'm going to be developing the ministry into some other things that i'm excited about sharing so i'll have free content and then coming up in 2020 2022 whoa I'm going to have some paid content that I think is going to be very interesting uh, to folks as well, as well as two books on the way. So, I mean, there's a lot coming. Come on, you man. All, you all are worth it. Until next time. Thank you.